you'll, there have been a couple of themes that have been coming through in the talks you've seen so far, and this really is about teamwork and looking after the patient. And the teams vary between the pre-operative team and assessing who has mitral regurgitation, how severe it is and when it should be intervened on, the actual intervention team, and then the team that looks after the patients post-operatively. But it is a continuum of care and at various times everyone needs to buy in and look after these people. So what's the big deal about robots? Okay. Sorry, the sound isn't projecting quite as well, but this is the music that we play every time we bring a robot into the theatre. <laughs> what is a robot? Well, you can see here it's a console that the surgeon's sitting at. There is a patient... There is a cart which has a viewing screen above it and the, there is a patient side surgeon. And this is over and above anything else you're already doing. So why take a beautiful VATS minimally invasive mitral repair and make it look like this? Where somewhere under there there's a patient. My wife's an anaesthetist. She's extremely suspicious of the robot and the ultimate design. So as most of you will realise, a lot of surgical evolution has come through warfare and she thinks that the surgeons are planning to sit in the bunkers behind the robot consoles while the anaesthetists are out in the field resuscitating the patient and connecting the robot to them. So what are we looking at? On the left there you can see a console and what this does is allow you to see inside the heart in three dimensions. That's surgery is two-dimensional on a screen or looking down a long dark tunnel. And as Michael Stephen, who some of you will know, a vascular surgeon, said throughout my training in this institution, if you can see it, you can sew it. And if you cannot see what you're doing, you will not be able to repair a valve. The instruments you'll see on the tray on the right are long and skinny. And the big advantage the robot has is that they have a control console which connects to the robotic arm and gives you a wristed movement. If you have a VATS instrument, you have three degrees of freedom of movement. You can move it in and out, you can rotate it, and you can angulate it. With an additional wrist on the end of the robot, you have near, um, you have seven degrees of freedom of movement, so you've got individual articulation and angulation at the wrist as well as the arm. And this is how you translate that. And I look much better doing my robotic surgery because this diminishes my tremor by about a scale of three to one. So you can get scaling of movement. You have an accurate control to open, close, and then use this in a wrist so that what you do underneath the console is then replicated inside the heart. And this is the first iteration of these devices. There are new devices coming. So they'll become more transportable, easy to move in. This has a laser-guided docking system and instrumentation system. And single site technology is on the way where with one single instrument port you'll be able to introduce a camera and three arms, one of which will be able to retract, one will have a dissector and one will have a grabber. And I think this technology is still in its infancy. I can see a time when we'll be operating inside the ventricle of the heart, off bypass with the heart still beating. So where have we come from? As you've heard, and I'll skip through this fairly briefly, but... Mitral valve surgery has its origins in rheumatic heart disease where the valve was either split or replaced. We're moving on to degenerative valve disease now where the options of replacement versus repair are being debated. And ischemic mitral disease is a different disease to degenerative, so I'm going to confine my comments to degenerative valve disease. This was the first mechanical valve replacement and in the six, early, late 60s and 70s it was the only one available. It saved a lot of people, but it has limitations in terms of flow characteristics and size. Things have improved somewhat. This is a bioleaflet valve, again, a mechanical valve necessitating warfarin. You can see on the screen there, there are near cords going down to the papillary muscles to attach them to the annulus so that you preserve your ventricular geometry and function. So what are we talking about? It's a spectrum of disease. I'll show you the same slide everyone else has showed of um, degenerative disease, but that has implications for the repair you do. 
the repair techniques. I think Jürgen's comprehensively covered those, so I won't dwell on them except to say the concomitant procedures are equally as important and you need a good team of people to work up the patient and decide who should have an atrial fibrillation ablation or Cox Mays procedure, which patients need their tricuspid valve addressed at the same time. Because the last thing you want is to send somebody out with a competent mitral valve only to find that they've got severe right heart failure and you should have fixed their tricuspid valve. There is a debate in all surgical presentations about mitral valve as to respect versus resect. So Carpentier's vision in being able to devise a repair without echo is just unbelievable. We're now heading past the phase when I was a trainee of the echo says there's MR, please fix, to a bespoke operation where you have details of the particular cusp of the leaflet that's leaking, the length of the cords that are going to be needed to bring it back into a plane of coaption, the size of the annular plastic ring that you'll need to use. So resection is most viable where there is excess leaflet tissue, which is the Barlow's valve you see to the right, and the fibroelastic disease on the left is one where you cannot really resect the tissue. If you resect that posterior leaflet, you'll end up with a stenotic valve and a poor repair. I'll skip through this fairly quickly. That's clearly a Barlow's valve. See if I can get this to play. Well, I do apologise for that. Technology's beaten me here. This happens for all the movies, it'll be a problem. The, um, any suggestions on how to get this? Double click? On there? Yeah. Oh dear. They were working. All right. In the interest of time, move. the echoes here unfortunately doesn't play. And what it shows is not only is there a ruptured cord with prolapse of the leaflet through the annuals, but it actually shows the annuals rocking as well. And the repair needs to deal with all components of that cause of repair. This slide's been shown. I concur with Jürgen and Mark of comments. Standardising the lengths of cordal repairs makes for a more reliable replacement. And you need to consider all aspects of the valve and annuloplasty as well as an alfieri repair. So robotic surgery. At Macquarie Hosp University Hospital, we have access to a robot. We compete for it with the urologist particularly. And we elect, we were interested in setting up a robotic program. To do this, the two surgeons went to the US and trained in East Carolina with Randolph Chitwood. We then came back and um, were proctored by Aubrey Omeda from Melbourne, who's done now over 400 of these procedures there. And when he was satisfied with our learning curve, we were then on, went on to independent operating. But to set this all up, you need a team. You cannot do it alone. And to try and go one out is doomed to failure. You have to have good anaesthesia. The patient needs to be lined up, including necklines, monitoring, outputs. You need good perfusion. It is different running peripheral bypass. I think we've been very lucky to have Paul Forrest particularly push us into the um, use of ECMO for respiratory failure and heart failure. We are now far more familiar with wire techniques, placement of lines, so you avoid some of the other problems of you know, inadvertent cardiac perforations. You also need good echo pre to assess if the valve is repairable, post to make sure that your repair is competent and that it doesn't need to be re-intervened on. You need to have theatre staff that are comfortable looking after these patients and bringing them back. It's not the same for a post-operative bleed and a minimally invasive approach as it is to a stenotomy. 
their ICU care and ward care similarly needs to be looked at in a pathway type approach. So what do we use the robot for? Mitral valve repair. You can use it for the tricuspid. We are interested in pursuing um, minimally invasive access to the coronary grafting, harvesting mammaries and doing them off pump through minimally, mini thoracotomies. And thoracic, it also has some applications, particularly mediastine tumours and lung resection. And we've touched on guidelines, and that's the role of a team, is to actually give you a patient that needs a procedure, the correct procedure is done in an expert manner so that the end result is improved symptoms and long-term survival for a patient with these diseases. Some of the advantage of a minimally invasive repair, there are particular patient factors. People do not like the thought of a stenotomy and people don't like coming in to see a surgeon to be told they're going to have an operation. The external healing and issues of mediastinitis are just not a problem with this approach and I'll show you a picture of that later. The surgeon factors, I'm coming to the view more now that it is a much better visualisation and I can think of valves that I've had to then retract and you're basically looking at a structure that lies horizontally across the chest and you're looking from the front and you have to rotate it out, caught on the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava and aorta to get a view of the mitral valve. If their atrium's big, it's usually not a problem. If it's small, it can be very difficult and I can think of cases in whom I think that distortion has compromised the repair. So I think they're more repairable, but I also concur it does. It is technically more demanding and takes longer to learn, and you do have longer bypass times. I think. So what is a surgeon of the future going to look like? I think we need to be members of a heart team that looks at valves. We need to be across what is the best treatment, so minimally invasive or um, minimal access surgery. We need to be using hybrid technologies. And this is the sort of teamwork that you can see. We've got two surgeons looking after a patient. We've got a cardiologist, interventional cardiologist in the background. We've got an ECMO machine out to the left that you can't quite see in the theatre here. And if they then need advanced support during a minimally invasive procedure, that's possible. For mitral valve repair, again, you need to have a, a comprehensive approach to what the patient needs. Are they appropriately treated by a minimally invasive repair? Should, is it better to do a stenotomy? Or should they have a less invasive or transcatheter approach? The clip you've heard mentioned, we are looking at annulaplasty devices either placed within the ventricular cavity or through the coronary sinus. And having a comprehensive approach to this so that you can evaluate what is the best intervention for each person and their individual circumstance will give you the best results. So the situation in Australia, I was fortunate enough to be a, a general surgery registrar back in the early 90s when laparoscopic um, gallbladder repair came out in my first six months in the country. I did uh, 40 open gallbladders and the next six months I did 40 laparoscopic gallbladder excisions. Minimally invasive surgery has been around for a while and it has a much slower uptake and there are many reasons for this. Because of the complexity of running a heart-lung machine as well as doing all of these approaches, it, is, it has a longer learning curve. And there have been many sort of promising starts and failures. Hartport was around at Stanford in 97 when I was there. Um, they suffered, I think, from lack of sophistication in some of the technologies, certainly the bypass and wire techniques we now have would have greatly aided them in getting their um, market share up. At a similar sort of stage, you've heard from Jürgen that in Leipzig there was the VATS approach to the mitral valve, whilst in East Carolina there was the da Vinci repair. In Australia, we have centres in Adelaide, Sydney, it's in Vincent's, Brisbane and Perth doing VATS repairs, and Albury in Melbourne has a significantly large series of da Vinci repairs to its credit. So we're taking a theatre that looks like this, where you've got a bypass machine on the right, we've got a patient being put on the table there. We've put in the corner here a robot that hasn't even been wheeled across there, so it vastly increases the 
complexity and organisational challenges of the theatre. And robots just aren't for everyone. You do need to work well as a team. The particular advantages are the optics, the um, wristed instruments, which give you much better control within the small atrial chamber of the heart and through the leaflet to work with. So this is setting up a patient. I have trained in Leipzig too, where we just used the peripheral venous from the femoral vein below, but to get reliable drainage and a uniformly good exposure, we've been using necklines, a small cut down on the groin, a mini thoracotomy with stays retracting the diaphragm down and a clamp put across from there. And that's the, the VAT's appearance. Sorry, I've been going backwards. Here you can see at the bottom, that that's a cryoablation line to perform a cox maze. So we need to address all components of the patient. We want a patient who's in sinus rhythm, who doesn't have an atrial appendage. If they do happen to go back into short paroxysm of atrial fibrillation where clot can develop, so you, we exclude the atrial appendage as a suture. We then assess the valve and place our annular plastic sutures. Size the, size the valve to select the correct size annular plastic ring. And technology is advancing. We're not using individual knot tires here. We've now got a swage that can clip the sutures core knot. I think that will increase the utility of the operation by reducing some of the bypass times. And there you can see a competent valve with a, water, with a test. 